We're really looking forward to hearing from you tonight, Tom, on the rewilding movement. Um, just wanted to share that this is part of our spring speaker series and we have seven more events coming up. Um, three this coming month in April, including um, Coyotes of the Northeastern Forest with, with ecologist Christine Schaebler of New Hampshire. And on Earth Day, we'll be celebrating Earth Day with Nature Night Trivia. Um, so that promises to be fun. And at the end of April, we'll be welcoming Eileen Christ, author of Abundant Earth, for a more participatory conversation. Um, so you can see those and more of our May events at the website listed here. I'll also put that in the chat after this introduction. Um, and <clears throat> to share a little bit about Northeast Wilderness Trust with you all, um, I know some of you are good friends of the trust and some of you might be joining us for the first time tonight. Um, so we are a land trust. My name is Sophie Veltrop. I am the outreach coordinator at the Wilderness Trust. Uh, we are a staff of nine and we work across New England and New York to protect forever wild landscapes which means places where nature comes first, nature is the one calling the shots. These lands are not managed or logged. Um, and to date, we've protected 41,000 acres across this region. Um, and the photo you're seeing here is from our most recently protected landscape just this weekend, uh, Fresh News. Um, and this is the Reddington Wilderness Sanctuary. It is a new, forever wild landscape in the western Maine mountains, uh, close to Rangeley, Maine, and it protects 3,415 acres of land. Uh, so these forests will be rewilding over time. They lie just next to the Appalachian Trail. Uh, they're an important home for bird species, moose, and plenty of other plants and animals. It's also the site of more than five headwater streams that originate on that property. So really special place and we're really thrilled to share this um, success with you tonight. Uh, another quick announcement, we just got in our uh, limited edition custom bandanas and these are um, these are gifts. We don't do we don't do a whole lot of swag here at Northeast Wilderness Trust, um, and we like to keep it quality when we do. Um, these are organic cotton and hemp bandanas, um, and we do a limited edition run each year. And these are gifts for our monthly donors, um, which we call the Forever Wild Circle. I see some of you out there in the crowd tonight. Thank you for your support, sustaining support of Northeast Wilderness Trust's work. Um, so if you're interested in getting one of those bandanas and supporting our work in that way, I will also put a link to that in the chat after this. Um, and if you're an existing Forever Wild Circle member, you can grab one of these bandanas by increasing your gift by $5. Uh, this artwork is by Rachel Sargent Miris, a Vermont artist featuring a wood frog, a red eft, the juvenile stage of the Eastern Newt, which is uh, on the bottom left. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Tom Butler for our talk on rewilding past, present, and future. Uh, Tom is the author and editor of more than a dozen books, including Wildlands Philanthropy, Plundering Appalachia, Keeping the Wild, and Energy, Overdevelopment, and the Delusion of Endless Growth. As Northeast Wilderness Trust Senior Fellow, he serves as an ambassador for wild values. Before joining our staff this year, Tom was a founding board member of the Wilderness Trust and past board president. Tom formerly worked for the Foundation for Deep Ecology and Tompkins Conservation, where he now serves as a board member, and as an editor for Wild Earth Journal. When not in front of a laptop, like tonight, he spends as much time as he can exploring in his canoe. So welcome, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. And I'm going to pass the mic to you with this quote. The best arguments in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. Well, thank you very much, Sophie. I very much appreciate that kind introduction. Thank you uh, to everyone who's here with us this evening. Greeting friends out there in Zoom land from the foothills of Vermont's Green Mountains, where I can report that the Woodcocks have been back and doing their aerial dance at dusk right over the field. 
there for the last week or so. The wood frogs are singing as of today, and the sap is rising in the maples. A heads up, uh, over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to speak of um, thuggish behavior and a violent confrontation. There will be large creatures with big, fierce, ferocious teeth that appear. There will be an ineffably winsome little loon chick that shows up. Um, there will even be poetry. There will not, however, be beautiful uh, landscape and wildlife photography like we saw last week in Sue Morris's presentation or those nifty charts that we saw from Mark Anderson's talk two weeks ago. There is just going to be uh, you and me talking and listening, listening and talking exactly the way that people have been communicating for the last 70,000 years, except for the Zoom thing. So here begins our story. Once upon a time, many years ago, an old friend of mine was riding his bike. He is a conservation activist, but that's irrelevant here. For our purposes, what you need to know is he's a biker, an avid cyclist. And to keep things anonymous, thoroughly anonymous, we are going to call him Jason. We'll use air quotes that first time we use the word Jason. Jason was nearing home after a long ride. He's going fast down a hill. It's a two-lane blacktop road outside his town. And as he hears a car coming up back from uh, the left to overtake him, he scoots over to the as far as he can get to the right side uh, without dropping onto the shoulder, which is a few inches sort of below the main pavement and sort of broken pavement there. So he gets all the way over as far as he can. And as the vehicle comes up on his shoulder, it slows slightly and someone gets up right, hanging out the window, gets up in his face and shouts, boo, and hits him in the head. Now, this is startling, obviously, and Jason breaks hard and he drops down onto that highway shoulder and he swerves and through luck and skill, he is able to stay upright. He does not wipe out, he does not break bones, he is not killed, but he is mightily annoyed, as you can well imagine. He was seething at the idiots who had harassed him and could have caused him grave injury. And so with a few, within just a few minutes, he pedaled even faster. He shortly got home and uh, he just jumped into his car to scout around town to see if he could find those gentlemen. And uh, did I mention that Jason is super fit very strong, and uh, no shrinking violet. He's from Long Island. Enough said. Sure enough, he finds that van parked right outside the grocery store, and he waits. Two guys come out. Remember me? He asks. The first fellow looks blank. Boo! He says. The other guy starts to laugh, and he explains, of course, that he's the biker that they almost got killed back on the highway a few minutes before. A conversation ensues. You might call it a spirited conversation. Jason's from Long Island. And during which this, uh, this period, Jason explains to these chuckleheads how dangerous their little stunt had been. So after this escalating exchange of views, thug number one starts to get pretty nasty and he starts to approach Jason with serious menace. Nobody's going to talk to me like that. And at that point, Jason who happened to be holding a wooden axe handle in his hand that he had curved back and um, uh, out of view behind his arm, he swings the axe handle right at the man's head and stops it just an inch right outside his temple. And with a last encouragement to these gentlemen, and to this one in particular, in all things to be courteous, but most especially in vehicle and bicyclist relations, to be nice. He gave him just a little tap. Be nice. Well, being nice is very good advice for sure. And for years after, Jason's friends would encourage him to recount that be nice tale. No camping trip among his buddies was complete without it. And it became, as friends and family lore often does, part of our collective memory of knowing and loving Jason. So years go by, and at one point, that be nice story came up with another mutual friend when Jason wasn't even present. Again, keeping things fully anonymous, we'll call this person John. 
And John, who's also an avid cyclist, started telling me about the day when he and Jason had been on a long bike ride together, when the van had almost run them off the road, and how he and Jason had gotten back to Jason's house. They jumped in his car. They went and found the van in the parking lot to confront these brutes. And then, of course, how he watched Jason, with a light tap of his axe handle, encourage those folks to be nice. John remembered it vividly. He'd been there after all. And this was curious because, in fact, he had not. Jason was biking solo that day. At the time, Jason and John lived hundreds of miles apart. After years of listening to the tale and admiring Jason's response to that little assault, John had simply internalized it. He had put himself into the story, which if you've been reading about much about brain science is not all that surprising. Memory is fallible. In fact, you, you may have read that our brains, uh, according to the latest insights, are not computers or even high-tech filing cabinets. Our brain's ability to construct and reconstruct memories is amazing and not very well understood. But beyond that sort of physiology, I think there's something else going on here. With every breath, with every heartbeat, we live by grace. But while we live, we organize our lives by stories. We understand our place in the world by the tales that we tell ourselves. For as long as our species has been employing figurative language, some 70,000 years, we have been talking and listening, listening and talking to transmit the wisdom and the humor and the codes of right and wrong conduct that collectively form human culture. Only very, very recently has this cultural transmission happened through mediated forms of communication. The phone in your pocket, the book on your shelf, that's all something new under the sun. What's tried and true is talking and listening, the oral tradition. And thus, Jason's Be Nice story among his clan, a group of old and long-standing friends, assumed a role of cognitive superglue, sticking together the memories of multiple individuals who were not present at the story's genesis. It was not so surprising, then, that one of us put himself into the story. Some stories are so attractive that we naturally want to weave our lives into them. They give us meaning. This week, our Jewish friends and neighbors marked Passover. This Sunday, Christians around the world will celebrate Easter. Next month, millions of people will uh, observe Ramadan. The world's great faith traditions are built on powerfully compelling narratives which shape the lives of billions of people. And secular myths, too, influence uh, individual and societal behaviors. If I say uh, the American dream, everybody here listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. The world we make, the world we are making, is based largely on the tales that we tell ourselves. And one can argue, I think, that the present trajectory for life on Earth, and thus for humanity, is going to be a dark and difficult one indeed if we don't look carefully and quickly replace the false and dangerous stories that we have accepted mostly uncritically. Now, we could spend all night talking about and dissecting some of those. We don't have time to do that, but I'll mention just two, and very briefly. Number one, there is something called nature, and there is something called people, and these things are separate with the former's job to serve the latter by providing an endless stream of stuff, of natural resources for our use, enjoyment, and profit. Essentially, that is the dominant worldview that sees the earth as a very large magical supermarket that just produces stuff for us. In contrast, the worldview that sees the earth as a community to which we belong as one species among multitudes, all sharing a common home and a common destiny because we are all connected, 
That is the worldview, the much more characteristics, characteristic of grounded and place-based human cultures throughout human history. Bad eye numbers, idea number two, the big G, growth. Growth in human numbers and aggregate consumption can go on and on and on. Of this idea, the economist Kenneth Boulding once quipped, the anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. Now that's a pretty funny line, especially for an economist. But in one sense, I think Boulding was wrong. It's not just crazy individuals or tenured academics who believe or at least pretend as if this physical impossibility is true. We based an entire civilization on it, on the secular religion of perpetual growth, which is truly madness. Now, here is where I would typically present a litany of alarming statistics to back up this assertion of collective madness. I could talk about crashing wildlife populations and unraveling ecosystems or escalating climate chaos or the accelerating inequities between the haves and the have-nots in our human tribe. But since I took a personal pledge to keep this evening a statistics-free zone and to include poetry, wait for that, it's coming, I am not going to do that. And really, I don't think it's necessary, because anybody who has been paying attention has ingested plenty of such data illuminating the global eco-social crisis. If you are paying attention, the fire hose of bad news can be deeply depressing or even numbing, but I don't think it's particularly motivating. So if the delusional tales that we're telling us ourselves are what's helping drive us over a cliff, what should we replace them with? What new story is big enough to help turn the trajectory of humanity and the diversity of life away from ecological Armageddon? What story is inclusive enough and attractive enough to inspire millions or even billions of people to want to put themselves into it? I vote for this one. The story of rewilding of resurgent wildness enveloping the earth, of beauty on the march, of wilderness recovery writ large, of people from all backgrounds in every corner of the globe lending their energies toward helping nature heal at all scales to the benefit of all life. Consider this passage from the Global Charter for Rewilding the Earth, which was adopted by last year's World Wilderness Congress and endorsed by conservation groups from almost every continent. The Charter's vision statement reads thus. We believe the world can be more beautiful, more diverse, more equitable, more wild. We believe that nature's innate resilience bolstered by human care can initiate an era of planetary healing. In that future time when the world is whole and healthy, undammed rivers will run to the sea, their estuaries teeming with life. Following ancient patterns, whales and warblers will migrate unmolested through sea and sky. From tiny phytoplankton to tallest redwoods, all Earth's creatures will be free to pursue lives of quality and humanity will th thrive amidst nature's abundance. What do you think? Could that be the dream that's big enough to capture the hearts and minds of millions? That's both timeless enough and urgent enough to prompt bold action? Could it be the story that is generous enough to carry our love for specific places into the future in the form of interconnected ribbons of protected habitat wrapping the planet in wild beauty. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, it is. All right, let's stop for just a second to breathe.
<clears throat> okay. With apologies to Charles Dickens, we have now invoked the ghost of rewilding future. And now we're going to take a trip with the ghosts of rewilding past and present. 2020 was a crazy year, no doubt. Uh, there were millions of people around the globe dying from a new virus and countless others experiencing economic hardship and isolation. We cannot adequately express, and we certainly can't sugarcoat the suffering that that represents. But if there was the smallest silver lining in a very, very dark pandemic cloud, it was that many people learned, or at least rediscovered, the joy of being outside, walking, biking, canoeing. Trails were swamped with hikers. It was tough to find a canoe or a bike or a set of snowshoes to buy. People wanted to be outside in the company of trees and wind and birdsong. And there is a fascinating body of science emerging being developed by researchers about this topic, about your, your brain on nature research in, in a sense. And one of the leading professors in that realm is Professor Susan Messino of Trinity College, who studies the direct measurable physiological effects in the human body of time spent in natural settings. It's pretty neat stuff. Who knew? It seems that our bodies like to be outside in the wild. Our minds like it. Our stress hormones show it. And while the scientific tools to measure those effects are new, the experiential and spiritual and physical benefits of wild nature time are the oldest and most consistent themes in conservation literature. Think of Wordsworth and his pals wandering about the English Lakes District in the late 1700s, writing verse, extolling the beauties of the birds and the flowers there. Think of Thoreau escaping those already tamed farm fields and woodlots around Concord up to the Maine woods and climbing Mount Katahdin in the 1840s. And on and on and on and so on until we get to the present day and come upon the poetry of Mary Oliver or the elegant prose of Robin Wall Kimmerer in which she helps us relearn kinship with all our relations. The desire to reconnect our hearts and our minds to this greater community of life outside and away from the obvious artifacts of modernity, that drove the first wave of wilderness recreation to the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York in 1869 after the publication of a book called Adventures in the Wilderness. Thus began a period of ever greater interest in that region which was then being scalped by lumbermen. Now remember that in the mid 19th century America, forests were fuel, forests were charcoal to stoke the iron kilns, forests were chemicals to uh, tan the leather, forests were for lumber, forests were uh, to be cleared for agriculture. The wave of logging that caused, uh, that swept across our region caused the mountains to erode and the rivers to run brown with silt. So grave was the threat to waterways, which were crucial for transportation and for hydropowered industry downstream, that New York's state legislature created the Adirondack Park, or the Adirondack, actually the Adirondack Forest Preserve in 1885. Many conservationists had worked for that outcome, but it didn't stop rapacious logging. Timbermen then would buy the land, they would cut it over, scalp it, and then abandon it to the state for unpaid property taxes. And that was the genesis of most of the property which came into public ownership uh, within this newly created forest preserve, the lands of which were to be kept as forever wild. And then more substantial protections for the region came along in 1892 with the creation of the Adirondack Park, and three years later with the amendment to the state constitution that kept those public lands within the park, those forest preserve lands, giving them the highest level of conservation protection for public lands in the US. They cannot be sold or logged or mined or developed in any way without a difficult process of constitutional amendment. 
the conservationists who were responsible for creating the park and that central legal safeguard, which came to be known as the forever wild clause in the state constitution, those conservationists included the pioneering civil rights attorney, Lewis Marshall. Marshall was a leading activist against anti-Semitism, an early board member of the NAACP, and a brilliant lawyer who used the courts to challenge the structural racism of his time. He was also a dedicated conservationist and father of Robert Marshall, who went on to co-found the Wilderness Society. The Marshall family and so many other park advocates through the decades blazed a path that still leads toward expanding justice and beauty and health for everyone. And the Adirondack Park is today, arguably, the greatest example of rewilding on earth, the fullest expression of the incremental reforestation of the Northeastern US following the, uh, the logging associated with European settlement. Today, the Adirondacks are more ecologically intact, more secure wildlife habitat, and a better canvas for nature to play out its natural processes, creating and shaping and sustaining biodiversity than other parts of the region. The Adirondack Park provides tremendous social and economic values as well, and stores vast amounts of carbon naturally, which is a key to mitigating climate chaos. The wilderness lands comprising the Adirondack Forest Preserve are free, consistent with the etymological roots of the word wilderness to follow their own course. They are self-willed lands home to self-willed creatures. Speaking of, last summer, while camped by a lake in the Adirondack wilderness, I watched a loon chick and her mama. Now, for non-birders out there, you should know that loons are amazing swimmers, but not such easy flyers, at least when they take off. They must run, scamper essentially along the water surface to gain speed and flap hard to become airborne. The loons I watched were training. The little one would scamper across the water just as fast as he could go, and his mom would chase him. And then he'd get tired and he'd stop. And she'd run after him, chase him as if she was going to tag him. And he would start off and he would scamper as fast as he could go. And over and over, they repeated this game, getting the little one stronger for a long flight in the fall. It was just the cutest thing you can imagine. Heartwarming to watch that mother and her offspring, her little loon, at home, free to be loons in a place that never needs fear the bulldozers of tomorrow. So to, due to time constraints, we're going to have to jump over many decades and much fascinating wilderness movement history with only the briefest shout out here to Howard Zahnheiser, the author of the Wilderness Act, that 1964 law that created America's national wilderness preservation system on federal public lands. You see, because Zahnheiser was, at that time, a part-time resident of the Adirondacks. And he mostly drafted the landmark law whilst at his family's cabin near the Siamese Ponds Wilderness. As an Easterner, as a part-time Adirond Adirondacker, Zahnheiser knew that wilderness could grow as well as shrink. He saw the evidence all around him. And thus he used and deliberately used a rather obscure word in the uh, Wilderness Act's definition of wilderness. He used the word untrammeled. Something that is trammeled is bound up or caught, but something that's untrammeled is free or unimpeded. The Wilderness Act doesn't contain the words pristine or untouched because the defining characteristic of wilderness is not virginity, again, but freedom, freedom to follow its own evolutionary path. All right, now let's take one more little brief break to breathe and we'll finish up. Not sure if this Christmas Carol illusion is working for you, but um, let's get on to the ghost of rewilding wilding present. 
let's jump forward to the years after the passage of the Wilderness Act, through when uh, those years when conservationists uh, were successfully lobbying in Congress to add millions of acres to the National Wilderness Preservation System. One of the greatest activists of those decades was and is Dave Foreman, co-founder of the Rewilding Institute and various other groups during his storied career in conservation. Dave is a walking encyclopedia of wilderness history and policy and activism. In 1991, Dave and John Davis and a few others founded the journal Wild Earth, which first popularized the term rewilding that Dave had coined. You see, during this period in which Dave also co-founded the Wildlands Project, he recognized the need for a new word that meant wilderness recovery on a grand scale a scale that would allow populations of keystone species like wolves, cougars, and jaguars, which roam widely, to reestablish intact food webs by recolonizing their native ranges. At the time, there was a growing body of research showing just how crucial apex predators are to healthy ecosystems, both on land and in the oceans. But the young field of ecological restoration at that time didn't reflect this emerging science about large predators. And the papers published in those technical journals in restoration typically focused on restoring small, specific, individual degraded areas, that is sites, not restoring landscape scale ecological systems. Okay, so the focus was on sites, not systems. There was a need for a term that captured the latter. And Dave's genius for language produced rewilding. And then a funny thing happened on the way to today's global rewilding movement. The concept landed like a bullseye in the hearts of wild lovers everywhere. Do a search on the term now and you will see millions of results. Now, of course, new words inevitably evolve in usage once they're broadly adopted. And today, rewilding is used to represent not only large-scale wilderness recovery, including the return of apex predators, but also many other kinds of conservation projects. And even non-conservation uses are common. I think the oddest one that I heard was the term rewild as the name of a beer hall outside Boston. Not that there's anything wrong with beer, but it's a bit of a stretch uh, from the concept of rewilding, uh, including the continental scale wildlife corridors proposed in Wilder's journal in the 1990s. Now, maybe among this crowd, it is happy hour after all, maybe among uh, consenting adults and in controlled settings, beer or other fermented beverages have a modest role to play in rewilding ourselves, in rewilding our hearts and minds, a topic we come to now as we think about the global rewilding movement's evolution. Rewilding as an idea, as a meme, is powerful because almost any of us can put ourselves into that story. And groups around the world are doing just that, many of which have joined together in the recently launched Global Rewilding Alliance. Efforts as diverse as projects in India to restore native plants in a little urban reserve or expand tiger reserves in the countryside. Efforts as comprehensive as rewilding Argentina's efforts to reintroduce giant anteaters and pompous deer and now even jaguars into the great Ibarra marshlands of Corrientes province. Efforts like Trees for Life planting millions of Scots pine trees to help restore the great Caledonian forest in Scotland. Or efforts by rewilding of Britain to reintroduce beavers or lynx to areas of Europe where those species have been extirpated. And closer to home, we have groups within the American Land Trust movement, like the Southern Plains Land Trust, creating reserves and restoring bison in Southern Colorado. The Kentucky Natural Lands Trust, protecting some of the most biologically diverse parts of the Southern Appalachians. And certainly close to my home, close to my heart, 
is the work that my colleagues at Northeast Wilderness Trust are doing to protect the future ancient forests of our region. In current practice, a rewilding approach to conservation includes three key elements, which I tend to categorize with a trio of P words because I have an excessive fondness for alliteration. I talk about these elements as places, processes, and people. Places, of course, we need more and faster and bolder and larger efforts to gain permanent protection for wild lands and waters, whether we call them national parks or wilderness areas or ecological reserves or sanctuaries or no-take marine protected areas is less important than what they do, save wild nature's intrinsic, intrinsic functioning and provide secure habitat to our wild neighbors. Uh, processes, helping nature gain strength by strengthening natural processes, helping nature heal in effect. And this can happen through active efforts like removing dams or reintroducing missing species, and most especially those highly interactive species like beavers and apex predators. But also rewilding uh, can happen passively, that is through time and simply allowing for vegetative succession and other natural processes to produce diversity and complexity over time. The poster child, again, for that is the Adirondack Park, which has more than a century of experience doing just that. And the third element uh, is people. Ultimately, to rewild the earth, we need to rewild ourselves by which I mean winning hearts and minds to the great cause of conservation, motivated not only by self-interest, and self-interest is important, but also by our love and our desire to be good neighbors, love for our wild kin and our desire to be good neighbors in the community of life. Now, some groups focus on one or two of these three Ps and some do all three. And for the rewilding movement, they're mutually re reinforcing. Rewilding aligns perfectly with these emerging frameworks for global conservation, including 30 by 30. This is the, the effort to, to get target governments to uh, establish targets to protect at least 30% of their national territories by the year 2030, which is an interim step on the way to uh, the half earth goal articulated by biologist E.O. Wilson which in turn builds upon the um, equally ambitious Nature Needs Half campaign. Those aspirational targets for expanded protected areas address the conjoined ecological and climate crises with the appropriate scale of ambition. But are they possible? Are they impossible? Are they simply unworkable? Is it too much to imagine? Well, I don't think so. With the Adirondack Park, we have a six million acre protected area, the size of Vermont, which is a model, a more than century old model of a landscape where roughly half the territory is strictly protected, where nature directs the ebb and flow of life, and the other half is private land managed for farming and forestry with hamlets and towns and even small cities interspersed in a patchwork of wild and domesticated land. We have that model. It's not perfect, but it works remarkably well for bears and bobcats and people. The idea of those blue and green ribbons of wildness knitting up to wrap the globe in beauty well, that to me is a vision that is wildly attractive. But for it to take shape in reality, on the ground, will take bold action and funding, and this is the fun part, it will take us, people like us, people on this Zoom call, who simply love our home places and our home planet and want to do something about it. Conserving at least half of the earth in interconnected systems of natural areas will come to life only through the grassroots, bottom-up actions of people and groups and communities and governments, acre by acre, 
parcel by parcel, project by project. Rewilding will happen when people who love the land work to create the conditions in which nature may rebound. And that, Zoom friends, is wildly beneficial both to people and all our wild kin. So the question before us today is, will we put ourselves into that story, that great narrative of rewilding the earth? How will we do that? How will we use our time and our energy and our influence and our wealth to write that new narrative, one that's centered on beauty and integrity and health and wildness and reciprocity? I thank you for your time and your attention this evening. I thank you for all the things you have done and or will do to help rewild the land and rewild ourselves. Ultimately, of course, in the great multi-billion year pageant that is the story of life on Earth, nature gets the last word. But tonight, for our purposes, Hannah Stevenson will get the last word in her poem, Ancient Language. If you stand at the edge of the forest and stare into it, every tree at the edge will blow a little extra oxygen toward you. It has been proven. Leaves have admitted it. The pines I have known have been especially candid. One said that all breath in this world is roped together, that breathing, is the most ancient language. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That is a story that I would like to be in if I get to choose. And I'm sure many of our listeners are feeling the same way. So we have some questions from the audience, if you'd like to take them. I'd be delighted. Great. Um, so to start off, um, I think you'll like this question a lot, diving into both rewilding and language, two of your favorite topics. So you discussed a little bit the, the many meanings of the word rewilding, the original coining by Dave Foreman, um, and then the the range all the way to beer <laughs> of uses today. Um, Russ Cohen uh, dropped in a couple of resources about different ways that rewilding um, is used or interpreted. I've been fairly familiar with it as sort of this human rewilding spectrum, people learning sort of back to the land skills, wilderness skills, ancestral skills. Um, do you have do you have any thoughts about the intersections of these various definitions of rewilding, the global wildlife corridors being protected, the introduction of predators, the rewilding of lawns into butterfly gardens, and then this human rewilding of getting in touch with nature again and remem remembering um, our pre-civilization origins? How do you think those fit together and do you see any intersection between them all? Yes, I do. Now, I will admit to being possessive because I'd been there a little bit at the birth, at the, at the Genesis, and watched how Dave Foreman and John Davis, my other colleagues in Wild Earth Journal, um, used the word and how it was initially adopted in the kind of the literature in conservation. Um, and, I, you know, it, it, it's, its evolution initially troubled me. Mm. But ultimately, um, I tend to think that Again, first of all, you can't stop the way words evolve over time. But rewilding as a meme, as an idea, as an organizing principle for individuals and societies and for conservation is so big and so powerful and so interesting that it's good that it evolved uh, uh, beyond this sort of technical definition of wilderness recovery that would allow sort of keystone species to persist 
and you get intact uh, trophic webs, food webs would be uh, more healthy over time. It's, it still encompasses that, but it's also more because I've come to believe that without rewilding ourselves, that is without rewilding our hearts and minds, we will never get to the, the great cause of rewilding the places that, uh, that, we, that we love and that we want to see, again, be free to follow their own paths. So mm. I'm, at this point, I'm down with that evolution. I'm, I'm okay with it. And, and I like it. And I think it has great rhetorical power. And, and there, would, it, there wouldn't be 3 million hits on Google if it didn't. And that tells us something. It's too rich of a term to use in a small subculture of conservation biologists or wilderness advocates. Rewilding mm. is for everybody. And I love the idea that rewilding is being applied at all scales. Also from people creating pollinator gardens in their backyards to the idea of the Yellowstone to Yukon, you know, a co half a continental scale wildlife movement corridor. It, it, it functions at all scales. Yes, yes, the, the evolution and, and multi-use of the language itself is a testament to its universality and to its power as a story. Precisely. I couldn't have said it better. What you said. That's right. I agree. <laughs> ditto. Ditto to what you said. With you. Great. So another question from our friend Glenn. Um, our questions are rolling in. Let's see if so I got that one. Um, so actually another, another language related question. Um, so Glenn points out that the word protected is a very broad word. In conservation, there are so many levels and layers of protection. Um, so Glenn is wondering if you can speak to um, language that we might use when talking about land that is protected as wild and the distinction between that and other types of protected land um, the type of land that is needed to get by 30 to the 30 by 30 goal of protecting 30 percent of nature for nature by 2030 and by extension the half earth vision. Ah, here we're getting to the rub. Yes, conservation is a big tent. Conservation is a big term. On the map of uh, regional conservation efforts in the Northeast, everything that's conserved can vary uh, from the Reddington Wilderness Preserve that you mentioned that will be never logged, where there will be no mechanized recreation, where the trees will be allowed to live and die on their good old wild time, uh, from that level of protection all the way to uh, dairy farm fields that have been protected, conserved with a conservation easement to allow agriculture to persist. So I think Glenn is right that we need to be more precise when we're talking about lands protected for their ecological function, for nature. Um, and you know, there is a debate already emerging within uh, the land trust community and within conservation more broadly about what's gonna count, the 30 by 30, what counts? Is it, is it the dairy farm that has a conservation easement? Does that go on? Or is it the wilderness area? Mm -hmm. Or is it the managed timberland? that may be protected where there's an easement that allows it not to be developed, but the chainsaws and the skidders still run through and sometimes run through frequently. So um, I, I cannot offer any uh, you know, great words of wisdom beyond the fact that I think we need to be, at least those of us on the spectrum who are very um, dedicated to wild nature conservation, not that we discount those other important forms of resource conservation for managed timberland or agriculture. That's, that's part of the tent. It's important, it's complementary, but it is not equivalent in terms of ecological functioning. A farm field with dairy cows is not the same thing as a forest that is being left to grow old and wild and sequester wild carbon. One's gonna produce milk better, but the other one is gonna produce beauty and carbon sequestration and wildlife habitat a lot better. Both, things are the, both of those need to be on the landscape, but we need a lot more wild nature. And so we need to be talking very clearly about the 30-30 and the half earth goal as being a target for wild lands conservation. Wonderful. And um, this, this conversation 
uh, reminds me of John's, uh, John Leibowitz, the executive director of Northeast Wilderness Trust, recently wrote an op-ed that was published in VT Digger talking about this, this exact issue of what counts towards 30 by 30 and how are we going to achieve that goal in a meaningful way, including who is at the table. Um, so I will include that in the uh, follow-up email that all of you participants will receive after the talk in our list of resources. I've got a question here from Liz, um, which was actually echoes, echoes a question that I had uh, in, in my own list. Um, so Liz is asking about what ecological integrity and ecosystem integrity mean to you? How do you define that? And then to follow up, when do we decide when it's useful to engage in some human active restoration versus letting nature take take the reins and take care of itself? Oh my goodness, those are hard questions. Oh. And I'm probably going to um, offer some inept answers. The first, how do I think about ecological integrity? Um, uh, it's been a long, long time since uh, I looked at that paper that I believe was published by Stephen Trombolak, a conservation biologist at Middlebury College, on measures of ecological integrity. And I can't remember all the criteria that they um, incorporated in that um, paper. But to me, I think about it as a place where the key functions of natural processes, like succession, like intact food webs, where all your native species are present in ecologically effective populations and distribution, where basically all the family is there and doing what they do. I know that's a very simple answer, but that's how I think about it. And you can feel that when you're in a place like the Five Ponds Wilderness of the Northwest Adirondack Park, where there's 50,000 acres of old growth forests that due to a historical accident were never logged. It feels different. Mm -hmm. um, it's both beautiful, it feels rich. There are big trees, there are small trees, there are tip up mounds, there's lots of downed woody debris like Mark Anderson described in his talk to us two weeks ago. And it feels good. It feels wild. It feels holy. Mm. That's what I think about when I think about ecological health and integrity. Regarding the question about when is it time uh, to restore and when is it time to let nature sort of get on the, the slow train, the track and do its own thing. Um, I think that would take us probably all evening to sit around chatting uh, by a campfire. And so I'm not even gonna take a, a stab at it, duck in the question, but it's not easy and there is no one right answer. And also I will say that people of good faith can uh, disagree about when active restoration is more appropriate and when passive res restoration activities may be better. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Liz. Right. And, and just like the mix of conservation, there might be a mix of that happening across the landscape. Exactly. And I think one of the exciting things is to be able to compare that over time and to some, something I hear and believe in about the value of wild places where, where there hasn't been that human active restoration is that 10, 20, 30 years down the line, there might be the possibility of comparing that site to an active restoration site. And unless we have that baseline, we won't know. Exactly. You know, having a baseline is so crucial. It's, that is one of the, I just want to remind our, our audience here that that is one of the original arguments for wilderness areas. Mm -hmm. Go back, if you haven't read it lately, go back and read Alda Leobold's essay, Wilderness as a Land Laboratory in which he talked about the value of unmanaged wilderness landscapes as a scientific control to offer us a base datum of normality, is what he called it, against which we would measure, you know, how well are we doing in the humanized landscape. Wilderness as a Land Laboratory, I think it was published in 1948. It's, um, it's really worth rereading. Uh, wilderness areas as a control is a crucial value for wild places. Great, we'll include that in the, in the, um, resources email as well. 
Can I ask one other that we also include, since a number of people have talked about language, I, I gave another talk and it's also on the, the YouTube about the language of dominion mm. and how our language uh, creates the frames of a resourcist worldview or you know that community-based worldview. And um, so uh, we'll, I'd like to also circulate right. the link to that. It's on YouTube. It's called The Language of Dominion and Tom Butler, that would get you into it. Perfect, we'll put that link in there as well. And I may not have mentioned this at the beginning, but we are recording this talk and um, the link to this recording will be in that follow-up email. So if you missed the beginning or have somebody you wanna share this with, you'll get that uh, within about a week. Um, so another, another great question, um, to your point, you write about how, um, rewilding is a global act, but it will take many millions of individual actions on a local scale to realize that large vision. Uh, Charles is asking, we are the choir here. We, we all must have had some sort of interest in wild nature to show up tonight. Um, how do we, how do we preach to others who are not the choir and bring them along in, in this action. And what do, what do you think of as some of those, um, those individual local actions that some of us might well, take? Well, of course there are great local individual efforts uh, people can do on their own land by helping land be or grow wilder. Uh, everything from planting pollinator gardens in a backyard to leaving part of one's uh, forest unmanaged if you own property, all the way up to supporting groups like Northeast Wilderness Trust and other land trusts who are working to, to conserve bigger tracts. Um, but in terms of sort of winning people to the story, to the choir, that is a lot about doing and, and also celebrating. We live, I mean, literally, if I look out, Beyond the camera here, 40 feet that way, there is a moldering uh, old foundation. There was a dairy barn there. Now there are trees that are 80 feet tall coming up out of where there were barn stanchions. In the woods here, there are stone walls everywhere. Just on our little property here in the foothills of the Green Mountains, we've had moose in the pond, coyotes in the field, fishers, bears, coyotes, barred owls, Life is here, and that is a rewilding story. Almost all of the big critters that we can see on almost a daily basis used to not be here. There was a time when they were either entirely eliminated or nearly so. You know, almost all of us in the Northeast are living in a rewilding story. Mm -hmm. Let's think about it. Let's recognize that. Let's tell each other and let's recognize and acknowledge the beauty that, that can be accomplished and spread with more of that. Mm. Wonderful. And invite your friends and neighbors to join the choir by being outside, going out, doing something, being in a wild place, turning off the phones and uh, getting some news of the neighborhood. Yeah, speaking to the rewilding hearts and minds, man, if I can make a good difference for the world by going for a hike, I will certainly take that assignment. Um, so I've got a question for, uh, from, from Russ again um, about uh, Northeast Wilderness Ship, well, Northeast Wilderness Trust's emerging partnership um, with the Native Land Trust, the Native Land Conservancy down in Massachusetts that maybe we can both jointly speak to. Um, well, no, Sophie, why don't I give you that one? Because you uh, know so much more about it and we don't have John Leibowitz uh, present this evening to answer the question. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that partnership? Sure. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of Mahdi Pond before, that's a uh, 355 acre preserve down in just a bit south of Boston. It's protected as Forever Wild with Northeast Wilderness Trust. Um, but unlike, unlike what um, typical wilderness might bring to mind of a vast remote um, far out there place, uh, Muddy Pond is, uh, sits in the middle of, uh, there are two highways nearby, uh, I believe, and shopping centers. And it's just south, I think John likes to say 30, 30 minutes from Fenway. Um, 
So it so it's it's a forever wild place where we where there's a commitment to this land to um, allow it to to grow and unfold as it will in perpetuity. And yet it's also uh, not far away. It's right there where a lot of a very large population can can visit and see it. Um, and primarily, it's the home for some incredible species. There are plenty of birds there. There are some incredible endangered plants there. Um, the pond within it is a rare ecosystem. So it's just a fabulous place. And any of uh, any folks who are joining us tonight from Massachusetts, if you ever have a chance to visit, um, I highly recommend. So in that area, um, uh, the Native Land Conservancy is um, one of the one of the most recognized indigenous land trusts in in the country, and they uh, they work to protect land and have cultural um, easements there and be able to access the land for cultural uses. Um, so we have an emerging relationship with uh, the Native Land Conservancy down there. Um, doing some nascent programming and um, we'll have an announcement about that on our blog very soon. So I don't want to prematurely uh, say anything that we'll be, we'll be sharing imminently. Um, and if we can get that up on our blog by the time the email goes out, I will include that in the email to you all. Um, and if it doesn't make it into that email, it will be in our next e-newsletter and on all our social media. So we're very excited to share some developments with that partnership with you soon. Um, and just had to comment uh, that I struggle with accepting novel ecosystems as the assemblage, assemblages of species. I learned and love change over time, yet at the right scale, these new natural communities with some or many new species might develop functionality over a long period of time and new habitat types for wildlife. And Joshua asks, who am I to judge what's appropriate? Um, so in a, in a changing world, as we see ecosystems change, do um, you have any comments to share on that? Well, another tricky one, we could spend all evening standing around a campfire and talking okay. about that, about when it's appropriate to try to address exotics and novel ecosystems, and when it's, it's more appropriate to try to put missing species uh, missing you know the members of a land community that we knew was functional and only was degraded by human activity when it's be best to try to do that um there's no kind of silver bullet answer to that again i think we'd love to it'd be fun to have a, a long chat about it i will say that i tend to think about this in using the medical analogy when Michael Soule and other conservation biologists formed uh, the Society for Conservation Biology and articulated it as a sort of crisis discipline, they often used the medicine analogy. Um, when, when the land is sick, when it has um, suffered ecological wounds at our hand that we can see, that we can identify, and that we can readily help to heal, do we not have a responsibility to do that at times, if we can? You know, the, the medical analogy is also helpful in thinking about the role of restoration action being always in a frame of humility and putting nature in the driver's seat. The doctor does not heal the patient. The body's intrinsic powers heal from sickness. It is the role of the doctor if she comes in to set a broken bone or prescribe a medicine to serve the body's intrinsic healing powers. Mm. Thus it is with rewilding. I think it's our goal with a sense of humility and not a sense of managerial hubris to where we can help put back together the missing damaged places that we have caused and let nature heal. Rewilding at its simplest is helping nature heal. And everyone, almost everyone, I assume on this call, has at least some ability to do that in some fashion. Mm. Look for a way to do it. Be wild, rewild, get out there, be nice. <laughs> <laughs>